They've been with us throughout the ages, brewing those teas that make you feel better, always with the right soup to bring over to the house, the right breads, always knowing how to fix what ails you. Often in ways that you don't quite understand, they're bringing over a poultice or some potpourri because it'll make you feel better. You kind of look at them side-eyed, then you do feel better. Today, we're going to be talking about the cunning foot. This is a big topic and a little episode, so we're going to have to be brief with what we're saying, but it's a topic we may return to time and time again. It's an important one for us to realize that these people are out there. It really means that there are more of us practicing magic than would probably admit to. Let's talk about the cunning folk today as we walk together down creation's path. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, I am Brian. I am distractible today and sous chef to the Dodda. Yeah. So I'm not careful, I'm gonna get the big wooden spoon. So today we're talking about the cunning folk, which is a topic near and dear to my heart, since it is a tradition that runs through both of our families, but through mine, very close, near and dear to my heart. And this is going to be a complex topic. I think we can have a very lively discussion about it in the comments, but I don't think that there are any right answers or wrong answers. It's a broad topic. First, I think we should start with the right answers. Most people are going to end up falling under this category of cunning folk, whether they admit it or not. Yeah, probably. So before we get into it, don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're listening to us on. It really does help us out. Plus, we do original Christo Pagan and Druid content five days a week, Mondays to Friday on this podcast, even through the illness that just walked through the house. I'm sorry for my voice. I still don't feel like my voice is 100% better, but it's better than it was yesterday. So yay. Don't forget to subscribe. All right. On with the show. First of all, I think we have to start with what I would say is there are three kinds of cunning folk, just on a very broad, broad spectrum of things. There are intuitive cunning folk that they're probably not trained. They're probably not from a tradition, but they have an intuitive connection to the land, to the spirits of the land, and they just have a, a knack of knowing what to put you up. Those people are special and precious. If you find one, befriended them. They're wonderful, wonderful people. I am not one of these people. Green Magic and I are not the best of friends. I have done my best to learn it over the years, but I'm not an intuitive when it comes to this. Sort of fall under that, but it's a long, sad, and sordid tale that we'll come back to later in the episode. The second type are people who would call themselves some form of cunning foot. Now, there are so many words for this. I am not going to go into it. I actually looked up on Wikipedia before we started the episode, and... They have just two different Dutch terms, a Finnish term, a French term, German and Irish, Italian, a Portuguese, a Slavic, a Spanish, a Swedish, and a Welsh word of listed, each with their own tradition. And I am the mangler of words, so I'm not going to say a lot of them because I will mangle them. Under the Irish, they have three different Irish words listed, including the Benfasa, and the Ben Fod, I, I never seen those equated like that before. There's a huge breadth of traditions out there. These traditions are all folk magic slash folk healing traditions. I would include old school midwifery and a lot of traditional doula practices in this realm, where this is that traditional knowledge that has been handed down of these herbs help, these postures help, these practices help. This is how we work better for the health of the individual, the family, and the community. There are a lot of different schools in, the, in here, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different traditions that are getting lumped together under one word. The third category is, I heard this term on a TV show or a book, and I am going to apply it to myself, and I am going to practice mm. green witchcraft or some form of green wicca, but call myself a cunning person. Okay. I mean, is your, if you're doing the herb work, I'm not going to complain. I am not a gatekeeper. I don't like being gatekeepy about things, but I have seen some stuff out there that 
feels very much like I am going to rebrand my green witchcraft to say that it's cunning magic, that it's the work of the cunning folk, it's cunning tradition, because this term is one that comes in and out of fashion from time to time. I think that there is a distinction between green witchcraft and cunning practices. It's a tricky distinction because on one hand, you want to be like, this is culturally appropriative. But on the other hand, since it is so inflected by the individual practitioner's culture, yes, it's like, can it exactly cultural appropriate when something is reflective of the individual practitioner's cultures? So it's like... Pulling I'm, yourself up Ben Vasa or right. any of the other terms yeah. that are out there that have a very prominent tradition to them, and you are not practicing or participating in that culture then you can appropriate something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah. That's why, like, earlier I wanted to reference some of the other regions of the globe, but they're practices that I don't have really any familiarity with. And so that's also where it's like, it, it is, but also I'm not, definitely not an authority to be speaking on. So I would never get keep any indigenous tradition <laughs> out of being classified as cunning food. I feel that it is colonizing to lump them in to the practices of the cunning food because cunning practice is a result of colonization. Most of these practices would have been done by either folk healers, witches, druids, shamans of song strike, whatever the magical technician was in the societies in question. And as the weird witch cult heresy gets propagated in Europe, which by the way, when you hear stuff in, from the Middle Ages up through the witch, Salem witch trials, talking about witches, they're actually not talking about pagans. There was a whole weird idea of this anti-church that was founded by the devil. To it, it's, it's a weird thing. We can go into it at some point in a future episode. But they're not actually talking about like pagans or people that are even practicing the old ways in a Christianized fashion. The witch cult idea is a very strange one that we have kind of forgotten was there and are equating things that weren't actually equated in the minds of the people at the time. If it's tied into why we still struggle with imperialism and fascism and stuff like that, yeah. because a lot of it has to do with the, they, those strong person belief systems require an enemy or a villain that is other that is supposed to be so spooky and scary, but eminently defeatable. Yeah. And so in that particular and that's time period, that was the medieval witch. The medieval witch thing was like that. You see it in a lot of the other various racisms. Because when you get down to its core, it's the same thing over, just rebranded it, put a new skin on it and put it back out. What we see happening in Europe is a lot of those folk traditions basically getting ostracized, getting pushed to the sides, getting pushed to the margins sometimes being labeled as part of the witch cult, sometimes not. Sometimes there are distinctions that are put in. These distinctions get worse once medicine gets professionalized and all folk healers are witches for a time period. But because this idea that there are cunning folk, wise people, that comes out of this imperial colonization, this imperial church colonizing these traditions, I am loath to apply this term outside of the European context. If anybody outside the European context feels this term applies to them and wants to use it, I am not gatekeeping it. I just feel it's continuing that colonizing practice to apply it outward. That's fair. That's actually the um, way to put it. That's where this gets all manner of com complex. So the thumbnail for today's episode is actually a picture of my great grandpa. That's Poppy. Poppy was a cunning man. I don't know what he would have called himself. We never talked about him. Now, Poppy lived to a ripe old age. He lived well into his hundreds. I had a very good relationship with him when I was young. We used to sit on the, out in the swing under the maple tree, and he would just tell me stories. We would walk around in the woods, and he would point out plants and stuff. I've often talked about how I wished I would have been a smarter, more studious child and taken notes about everything, because just what I remember is gold. And I wish I had written everything down. Like, I wish this was a time period where smartphones were a thing and I could have recorded all of those conversations. I don't know what he would have called himself. I know one thing he would never call himself was a witch. Poppy was a Southern Baptist minister. But everyone called him Doc. To this day, I am recognized as Doc's grandkid. When I meet people in town, 
they go, oh, you're part of Doc's family. And when I told my husband this before we moved back here, he was like, that, 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 that's ridiculous. Like people are still referring to you in relationship to your great, great. Yes. And then we got here. Randomly stopped by random, what I thought was random strangers. I mean, basically we're random strangers. We don't really know them. And they're like, yeah, you're Doc's great kid. And everybody called him Doc because if they had a sick animal, if they had a sick person in their family, Doc knew how to fix it. He would go off in the woods. He would pick a whole bunch of roots, the berries and leaves and come back and brew something up, tell them how to use it. So, so send them on their way and their animal would get better. Their family member would get better. They'd get better. He was practicing the cunning arts. He knew all the herb lore of the region. He knew all of the plants that had medicinal qualities and what they were good for. He knew how to prepare them, how to mix them. He would very much fits the mold of a cunning person. And when you look at his family, there are stories about his great, his mother and whatnot going back. And this seems to be a tradition that he came from. He told me a lot that he learned a lot from his mother and father on how to do this. What he would have called himself, I was not old enough to ask. I didn't know any of these words when he was alive. I, and this is very important, especially as we're approaching Solon here, I cannot trust anything that I hear from him in my ancestor practice because wish fulfillment can blind you in spirit communication. So if I were to ask him, are you a cut, are you, were you, were you a cutting person? Did you identify as such? I can't trust the answer I might've got. Not to mention the trend lost in translation situation could also kick in where your brain, they, they may ref, use a term, but your brain may translate that as cutting person. Yep. But they are all around us and it is a different kind of art. And this is why I do have an issue with green witches entering this terminology for themselves, because I really, as far as making potions, tinctures, poultices, and whatnot, magic, witchcraft, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Most cunning folk are not casting spells. Most cunning folk are working within the milieu of the culture that they grew up in. So with all of his stuff that he would put together, he would pray over it in the name of Jesus. Now, I may look at this as a modern Christopagan and say, this is classic Christopagan where he's doing this very nature-based, earth-based spirituality, where he's pulling up the herbs and the roots and everything and brewing, let's be honest, a potion, and then praying over it. But he probably would not have used those terms for himself. And that's fine. And that's where this tradition gets really hard to kind of track and tricks. Whereas witchcraft is equally difficult because a lot of people, especially in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, just started calling themselves intuitives or psychics when they were actually coming from a witchy tradition because those were the popular terms at the time. Cutting folk used the language that was popular. He probably would have just called himself a healer. Yeah. And to me, cutting folk and healer is synonymous. You, yeah, you could find a lot of that. At least I've, I've found a lot of that. When looking at healers and talking with even quite a few doctors, uh, you know, they, they might get into more right. of the... The terminology is a little different, you know, because they might have the actual chemical breakdown for the herbs and stuff like, and, and plants and things that would have been used. But the potion making, the poultices, all that, the, the bombs, all that is in a way still exactly the same. They're just, you know, instead of just taking the, the whole root, the whole plants and mixing them, you're breaking, you're pulling out those specific elements of them and you're mixing them and delivering them, you know. So I do find a lot of healers. Uh, are cunning folk, uh, and a lot of them don't realize it because they're, they're using more of the, the modern terminology or there's stigma, you know, as we could say, un unhealed trauma from even before their time that has been handed down because of the witch persecution and everything else that went in there and the rise of, uh, not science, but rise of... Uh, 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 professionalization is usually the term that I use. Because it, the, the, you have both the enlightenment rationality yeah. like, like, that came up, which basically, if it doesn't fit into the mold of whiteness that we're pushing, why I go after the enlightenment as hard as I did is because it equates rationality with whiteness, with a constructed identity of whiteness, because there's no such thing as a white person. It was a constructed identity that then other identities were contrasted against. And of course, white people don't practice magic. This is core to this rationality that rose up. 
and it's problematic. But also you have the professionalization that, yes, a lot of folk remedies work and a lot of folk remedies don't work. And to me, this is where science and folk medicine should be working hand in hand. Because for some things, yeah, you can just go to a local folk healer. I think there should probably be more overlay between people that are really into this kind of uh, working and maybe being a pharmacist or something like that so that you have a better idea of how to do the mixing and the brewing and the whatnot. That's part of my disappointment with a lot of the homeopathy stuff because it's just like so many grifters have gone into that arena. I want to stop you real, real quick. Homeopathy is a term that we have broadened out. You're talking about herbalism, though herbalism and homeopathy have been equated. Homeopathy is this weird idea that I can put one drop of a healing substance in something and dilute it a thousand, a million, a billion times with water, and it'll have the same potency. That's homeopathy. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there was a specific charlatanism that I can't stand. Yeah. So then also, I guess there's also a general ignorance. Like, I just oh, think yeah. that it is yeah. very common to equate herbalism and homeopathy. We do this all the, all the time, that an herbal remedy is homeopathic. A homeopathic herbal remedy, remedy would be like St. John's wort. We do know helps with mild depression. A homeopathic St. John's wort would be you would put one drop of St. John's wort in a giant vat of water, and that water would learn to work like the St. John's food. Yeah. Strong, you're giving the look like you're trying to sell me some BS here. That's homeopathy. That's why I, I have wow. much against homeopathy. Yeah. Because that idea is that that's pseudoscience. But we've equated these two terms, yeah. which is why so many people defend homeopathy because it has to a lot of people become equated to herbalism. And this is something I do find uh, inspirational and hopeful with a lot of the, the doctors and, and nurses and medical professionals are starting to explore a lot more of this and starting to look into it and, note, and also recognizing the history that they actually come from and are able to move away from some of the prejudices, the built-in prejudices of the profession. So I know you're probably wondering by now, so Charlie, what does this have to do with me? We've talked a lot about what this is and isn't, and we haven't talked to If you have a healing practice, if you are called to green magic, if you're called to kitchen witchery, these are practices that you may want to hunt down. These are practices that you may want to pull out from your own family history and really try to delve into depending on your uh people of origin there may be a vibrant tradition out there that you can connect to and find a lot more meaningful connections you know i a fr friend of mine and i really connected over this idea of we we have a get better soup there's three of us we we all have our get best get better soup and they're basically the same soup so some of the things that get added to it as far as like just not just for flavor, but some of the accessories. Like, does it have noodles? Do you put matzo balls in it? You know, I'm always fed with a good matzo ball suit. Th those little things get changed on the edge. But we had all kind of concocted the same get better soup. And this laborious technique in making the broth. The broth takes time. So you always you have that broth in the freezer. Because it takes too much time for when you need it. You can't just make it on the spot. So you make that. You store it up, and then when you're not feeling well and you need to feel better, pull it out, you mix your other ingredients into that broth, and you make that magic soup. But that was me connecting with my people, that I learned these connections. I learned, oh, this thing that I am doing is part of this larger tradition, the herbs that were picked, the methodology. We all tend in magic to either feel like we have to do things wrote by the book, or that we're inventing the wheel. There's very little in between. And especially with everything going on right now, I think it's important for us to be reconnecting to these folk traditions and to these places of power that we've lost. I think it's important for us to find the cutting traditions either in our family or in our culture and update them. That, that's the biggest part, part of this to me is they're not, if we know that something doesn't work, but we know something that does work, there's a lot of research out there we can improve to, to make better. And I kind of feel like th those friends that I was just talking about, we've kind of created a little cunning circle where we're not just studying the folk ways, but we're also scouring the medical research. Oh, did you see what they found out about this herb, about this spice? Did you see 
what they found about this route and how it can help with this, that, and the other thing. And we're trying to perfect our craft both through the traditional ways and through the new ways. And this to me is how we move forward. But if you, one, don't know that there are traditional ways, you're going to feel like you're reinventing the wheel. And you also might feel adrift. You know, the cutting school that I come from, that I inherited from my family, had a very, I don't want to say toxic root in it, but a lot of it involved sassafras. Sassafras was the base in a lot of my great-grandfather's life. And we know that sassafras is carcinogenic. You can't use a lot of sassafras. In so that has, that's where knowledge is important. It has a wonderful t- taste. It does seem to have certain medicinal qualities. And there are times when I feel like there isn't a substitute and we'll still use just a little bit sassafras in something. But in updating our knowledge and staying current with what we know, I now know that the first step to most tinctures is not go outside, find a sassafras, as it grows wild right there, dig it up, take a chunk of the root, put it back in the ground because it'll keep growing. Oh, clean the root up, put it in the pot, get your tincture started that way. That's how all of the the folk roadies I learned start. That's not safe. And that's why I wanted to talk about this. I love talking about the old ways. And as we always say on the show, better is better. Old is not better. Better is better. So yes, we are connecting back to our ancestry, to our past, to all of those things that bring us to the place that we are and where we're wanting to go. But we are, we are custodians of this tradition. It is our job to pass forward what we've received, but to make it better. So when I teach people, I'll tell them the benefits of sassafras, but at the same time, I warn them, it is a dangerous herb to you. It is a dangerous root to use. And it's important to hold both of those. When, once again, when going through the process of the five powers, you know, it's, it's that cycle over and over and over again, learning and growing and making better each time you go for the cycle. You don't want to necessarily just throw out the sassafras because it's carcinogenic, because we don't know the exact relationship of the ingredients in it and the exact relationship of the carcinogen causing elements in it. By the way, it's as carcinogenic as having steak. Yeah. It's just, just, to, like, just to put it into context for yeah. people, because beef is also carcinogenic. Yeah. Living in a city is going to be far more risk of carcinogens than that's for, that's like just breathing exhaust. It was, yeah. But, it, and, and also the thing is, is as we, as science has learned and we already learned from even the old ways, certain things when combined together react differently and the body handles it differently when in different combinations. We know that certain vitamins require, some require fatty acids to absorb. Or we get nothing from that vitamin. Yeah. So if we have that vitamin on its own, it'll just pass right through us. Whereas we have with a fatty acid, we're going to get a lot of that vitamin all at once. And it's that, that same, real, it's understanding those relationships. And always updating our knowledge. And updating it. Because if I can stress one thing about any of this, if you get a book or learn from somebody, here are the herbs that do this. I'm not saying any of those sources are lying. There's a good chance that's what they were taught. The brilliant thing is we have science now. This is where science and the craft should be walking hand in hand. You don't have to speculate on what is St. John's word good for. You know, St. John's good for it was good for getting rid of the demons. Well, why was it getting rid of the demons? Because it can help with medium depression, like light and medium, light to medium depression. Oh, that's relieving a demon. Yes, 100%, right? We can see that in the studies and now we know, oh, that's why they would give black cohosh to, to women once they'd gone past menopause, because it does boost their the estrogen in their, in their system. That's why that was part, part, part of the medicine. But we can see, oh, it actually does this. It's like with the, the get better soup. You know, we know that collagen is so great for joint health, for skin health. And your skin protects you from all kinds of diseases and, and bacteria and everything. So it, it's just great for everything. It's, it's your shields for all the ills out in life, science, culinary exploration, chemistry, you know, the, the old ways, it turns out that that's why it was something that was done over a long period of time. Cause you had to get that, that meat that to a certain temperature and maintain it there for a while for that collagen to break down and be absorbed into the, the rest of the ingredients so that then it could be bioavailable for the body. 
So I promised early on a, a sad and uh, hopeful tale. But I'm going to go ahead and lay that on you now. For those out there that, that have had a feel like call this particular aspect of the craft, but you feel disconnected, there is hope. For myself, when I was young, I actually had both grandparents would probably be classified as cunning folk. At the time, they saw in me the, I guess say, potential or the ability, the innate ability to practice the arts and tried. I would almost probably say now reflecting back, desperately tried to get me to engage, to participate, to learn. And through folly, I didn't pay attention. I didn't learn, which is why I would say I'm a cunning person, but more of the intuitive side, because I had to basically re-intuit everything and learn it all, all over again. I could still pick up and read from other stuff. But the thing is, even if you've had that separation, you can still pick it up. You can still go back. You can still learn and you can still practice and you can still do it. Uh, a lot of my chef affinity actually came from that same calling. I'm kind of stupid when it comes to plants and herbs on that side, but I still just instinctively knew and still felt the urge to take that because well, both grandparents actually, but in particular, one side was very big into plant and plant growing and actually was part of a lineage of a greenhouse that's passed on through the generations. That's quite famous, actually, especially in one region. But I didn't get any of that aspect of it. I got more in the, here, you can take this and pre prepare it, the preparation side. But like I said, there's still hope. You can still connect back in. You can still learn. And it's never too late to do that. And I have the blackest of black faults. Like Brian's talk, talking about how, like, we wished he had listened when he was younger. I have the blackest of black faults. If you have a plant... That's causing me problems in your garden. I will come and I will lay hands on the plant and it will die. But it's so bad. The past couple of years, I was teased because I would bring fresh mint in to a restaurant because it's great for bar drinks and, and other culinary dishes. It's nice to have fresh mint. And I would do this over and over again because I would keep killing the mint plant. Mint plant. This is a weed. This is the easiest thing to grow. I would kill it and get another one and kill it and get another one and kill it. And get one and be like, sure, you, someone else take care of it, please. And then I would mess with it and kill it. But it's okay because that, you know, growing, once again, growing plants doesn't necessarily have to be your part of the, of the calling and of the cunning work. We live in a wonderful world where you can buy dried herbs. You can buy dried herbs. And I have not figured out how to kill dried herbs yet. The term we love to use around here, it's about your bailiwick. It's learning what you're good at and what you're not good at. And not beating yourself up over what you're not good at. Because you're not, you don't necessarily have to be good at everything. There are other people who are just naturally gifted at growing stuff. And that's their area. They'll take care of that. And I'll be thankful for what they produce and be able to use it. So if you are, feel a call to herbalism in any of its forms, think back, see if there, you have this in your family. And if not, look into your culture. But the one thing that I really want to shy away from is the idea that there is one grand cunning tradition that flows throughout the world. There are a lot of little cunning traditions that make up cultural cunning traditions that are kin with other cunning traditions. We don't need to strip away all of the knowledge that's there to try to mash everything into a simple uniform. Yeah. It's just like with witchcraft. There's the general infra definition that you can use that is a broad brush that many, many, many will fall under for witchcraft. But when you start getting into the nuance of it and the, the individual practitioner of it, there are many, many different ones. So we'd love to know your opinions on this topic. Are you a cunning person? Have you ever heard of cunning people before? Do you have them in your family? Do you have them in your culture? I, What's I would the love term to... that you can use for them if yes. you do have them? And if it is not easily read by somebody who speaks American English, if you could somehow phonetically spell it so I don't do a dumb, I would be very grateful for that. You don't have to. No pressure. Or if you know, the, if you know how to write it in IPA or you can copy it in IPA, which is not a beer in this context. It's the international phonetic alphabet. That would be great too, because I can read IPA. I, I would love to know what traditions you have. Is there a particular herb that you have found magical? 
in your life, herb, root, seed, what have you. Do let us know in the comments. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says you can leave comments, you can for engagement, but they won't let us, let us know that you did it. So take that comment and head over to creationspath.com, click on chat, and you can leave the comment there, and then we will see it. While you're there, if you have a few dollars you can pass our way, you might think about joining me as a member. You can also support us on Patreon and Kofi. I am CE Dorset on both. That money really does go a long way to helping us keep the power on, keep food on our table, and roof over our heads. And if you don't have any money, you can always share what we're doing to help us to grow which a lot of you have been doing. We've been growing amazingly fast right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Y'all are amazing. All right. So as we are heading into the, the season, and the season is changing, we're going to do something different with our prayer at the end. O hunter, lord of the wood, who teaches us to go into the wild places as the cold creeps into the earth, and we are seeking to find ways to get to the long, dark nights. Help us to find the things that will give us courage of heart, strength of spirit, and health of body, so that we may make it through to the dawn of the new spring. Amen. Amen. 